so um, this is me, and this is what I'm interested in. Um, I'm in the psychology department, as Patrick said, and one of the things that I'm particularly interested in is what makes children different from each other. Not why do, why do children develop along the same pathways, but why do some children develop differently to others? Um, so both in the sense of why do some children have difficulties with development and some children develop uh, along a perfectly typical pattern, but also in the sense of even within the group of children who develop typically, why are some faster than others? Um, and as Patrick said, I'm particularly interested in um, language development, but also in other aspects of development um, and in the influence that poor health can have on children's development, especially in developing countries. <coughs> so um, what I'm going to talk to you today are um, a set of tools which are called parent report instruments. And they're called parent report because we ask the parents what the child can do rather than getting the child to do things. And they're called instruments, which is just a fancy word to mean tests, questionnaires, measures, methods, etc. So um, why do we use parent report instruments? Um, one reason is that we can get information that we can't observe or measure directly. For example, if children are too shy, or if the behaviour is unlikely or inappropriate in public, and I'll give you some examples of that. We can get more information about a child than we could possibly ever do by testing or observing them directly. Um, parents can tell you about things that their child's been doing over the last few weeks. I think they might get a bit fed up if we came and sat in their house for weeks on end. Um, it's more efficient, and I dare, dare to say, um, well, I, I hate to say it's cheaper, um, we don't usually pay the parents to do this, or if we do, we don't pay them very much. Um, and also, children don't always cooperate, especially toddlers. This is your problem. Your basic problem with a toddler um, is that when they don't feel like doing something, they let you know. So, the other big question about um, using parent report instruments is, can we trust parents? Will they tell researchers just what they think the researchers want to hear? Will they forget what their child can actually do? Um, or will they attribute things to their child um, that their child can't do? Um, so um, I should say that in a minute I'm going to get you to write something down. So um, you, you might want to think about whether you've got anything to write, some, write things down on. Um, I will give you a bit more warning nearer the time, but I thought I'd tell you that now so that you can um, have time to get something out that you can write things down on. So, where did this all start? So, in the 1960s to 70s, people have been asking parents about their child for quite a long time. Um, and one of the areas which is not particularly my field, that, um, where people tend to ask their children about parents about their children, is children's behaviour, by which um, in my field we mean good or bad behaviour, basically. We mean, um, does the child present a problem? Is the child easy to manage? Um, does the child fit in well, make friends? Or um, do they have things that we might give us concern um, about um, how they interact with others? Um, that's not particularly what I look at. So looking at children's language, in the 1960s, um, to 70s, people started looking more seriously at, um, in particular, the differences between children and how and why some children might develop faster than others. And to start off with, they suggested to a small group of parents that the parents might keep a diary and then they would have sessions with the child to videotape what the child could actually do. And they soon found out that the parents were pretty good at telling you either what the child could do now, in other words, um, you would ask the parent and then the child would do, this, do that, that thing um, in the session, or um, that the, the child would do it in the next session. So the parent had seen them do it, um, and the child would, um, in a session with the researcher, would, would um, say the word or perform the gesture or do the puzzle that the parents said they could. Um, and in fact, not necessarily um, immediately in the same session, but within the next couple of sessions. So they suggested that the parents were accurate about um, what the child could do, but also that um, the, it was um, slightly more efficient to ask the parent than to 
um, see the child twice um, and spend ages coding the videotape, etc., etc. So rather than just ask the parent, um, well, just tell me some random things that your child has been able to do or that they have done um, for the first time recently, they decided to structure the interview a little bit more. Um, so um, they started to structure questionnaires rather than, as I say, um, saying, oh, just tell me everything that your child can do. They started to stru the structure questionnaires along the lines of, can your child do this? Can your child do this? Um, and the difference between those two types of questioning is the difference between two types of memory that we know as recognition memory and recall memory. So um, now I'd like you all to try and get out your pens and paper, but don't, or whatever you're going to write on, but don't write anything down yet. I'll just wait for the rustling to stop and at that point I'll assume that everybody who's got something has got it out. Right, that sounds okay. Right, so recognition versus recall memory. Um, it's a well-known phenomenon um, and I'm going to um, show you something now which is, you'll all be familiar with the game, Kim's game, so don't write anything down yet, please don't cheat um, and um, Put your pens away, ladies, in the front row, um, or put them down for the moment. Um, so you're going to have a short number of seconds, not too long. I have pre-tested this, um, and you, I'm going to ask you to try and remember what's in the picture, and then after that, you're going to be writing down what you saw. So a slightly funny story, which is entirely, don't write it yet, I haven't told you to write it yet. Um, a slightly funny story, it's entirely unrelated to the topic of this lecture, but um, when children start school, they're not very good at remembering things and they don't have very good strategies. And I'm a brownie leader and one of my new brownies, um, we asked them to do this and um, one of the new brownies looked at the older brownies and said, why are they all looking at the, the things? What's the point of them looking at the things? Because they were all looking at them hard and trying to remember, but she hadn't got that yet. Okay, that was to distract you so that you had a little bit of time to forget those. Um, right, so I'm going to have to time this one. Okay, so you now have a period of time in which to um, remember the items and I will tell you to stop when your time is up. Okay, stop. Right, so you can now have some hints. Right, so now write separately because I want to compare the answers. How many of those, were, which of those were there? Off you go. Write which of these were there. So this is a group of things. Some of them were there, some of them weren't. So this is a separate list because I want to see how many you get right from each one. <laughs> I mean, I know. <coughs> right, okay, they've gone. Right, you had the same amount of time for each of those. I know it probably didn't seem like it. Okay, so now I'd like you to tot up how many you got in your first writing list and how many you got in your second writing list and here are the answers.
Perhaps we do need this on a higher resolution. <laughs> it's not just physics that needs a higher resolution. It was a golf ball. Right, so has everybody got their totals? Anybody still counting? Right, I'm just crossing my fingers this works. Um, so the first list was what we call recall, where you have to remember without any cues, you don't get anything in front of you that gives you a clue about what might or might not have been in the memory list or in the memory picture. Um, did anybody, get, anybody want to end up to getting nothing right the first time? Either nobody got nothing or nobody own, is owning up. How many people got one to three right the first time? How many people got four to six right in the, in the first list? And how many got seven to ten in the in, right? That's quite a lot. Uh, the second time, did anybody get nothing right the second time? You know, good. Uh, did anybody get one to three right the second time? Oh, oh, that's better. Oh, almost. Um, anybody get four to six right the second time? Um, and I'm assuming everybody else either didn't count the rest. Who got seven to ten right the second time? Okay, so you didn't do too badly. <coughs> Perhaps I should have given you even less time that in looking at the picture because um, I, I originally allowed more time than that, but it was too much. Um, but I think just from my completely unscientific and I haven't even bothered counting, um, I think that there were fewer people who got very low scores. And um, it's... In this kind, when we're asking parents to remember what their child said, what their child can say, or what their child can do, um, it's we're, we're never going to get the, get it perfect. But it's better not to have parents who are remembering very little of what their child says. So the difference between these recall, where you just uh, you don't have a cue in front of you, and the um, other type of memory task. Um, when you have the list, but some of them are items that are present or were present and some of them are items that are not, is called recognition memory. So we rely on the fact that recognition memory is more accurate than recall memory when we're asking parents to remember what their child can and can't do. So um, this, um, all this research, um, interviewing parents, videoing parents, working out the best way to give, get parents to um, give us good answers has led to the development of a set of instruments called the communicative development inventories. So don't worry about the fact that you can't read those, they're just supposed to be pretty pictures. Um, and these are the original set of um, communicative development inventories, um, which is uh, my, the main area of research that I'm going to be talking about. Um, it's um, mainly in um, mainly used for um, child language research, but I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about other areas of research in which we can use this type of technique. So, um, <coughs> the MacArthur Deve um, Communicative Development Inventories were first developed fully in the US in the 1990s, and they consist of um, lists of words that a child may understand or may say, or both, um, and they also include gestures that the child um, may use and phrases that they may use. So, um, <coughs> does this work? I've pressed it. Oh dear, how low tech. Um, so um, this is from the very beginning of um, one of the um, sets of words. And this is one of the first things that children learn um, is they often learn sound effects and animal sounds. And if you came to my house, you would hear a lot of these. Um, and for example, we ask whether their child understands or understands and can say, and then we give them a list of words. And this goes on for several pages, but not too many pages because you don't want to lose the parent's interest. So um, we um, use this because 
As I've said, toddlers are very good at deciding that they don't feel like cooperating. Um, it's not just that um, toddlers can react badly um, when they're asked to do something. <coughs> Um, they can also be very pleasant, play very nicely, but not demonstrate in um, a testing situation abilities that we know they have. Um, apparently the milk was cold. Um, so some behaviours are quite easy to ask a child to do um, in the lab. So within, um, as I've said, within this um, area of research on children's language and communication, we often look at children's gesture, things like waving, nodding their heads, and we also look at pretend play. Um, so pretending to feed a dolly is something that you can quite easily set up a child to do in the lab situation, but they may not cooperate. Um, we can... Um, get them um, often to um, name simple objects that we have around the lab. We can get them to tell us which of these two objects is the doggy, um, or show us which is the doggy, show us which is the cup, show us which is the hat. But other types of behaviours are very, very common and very important in children's development, but they're a lot more difficult to observe in the lab, and in some cases might be quite inappropriate to observe in the lab. Um, so it's a bit harder to ask a parent to get their child to pretend to breastfeed in a lab situation. Um, a lot of uh, children's early words are for body parts. They may be happy to tell you that their child knows the word for genitals, but they're not going to necessarily um, be happy with you asking their child to say those words. And yet um, body parts are a very important part of children's um, early vocabulary. Um, words to do with potty training, nappies and so on. Um, are also difficult to assess in a lab situation, but an important part of children's early vocabulary. So, um, this is all very nice, and yes, parents will tell you things, but it does help if we know that it works. We help, it helps if we know that um, the um, words and gestures that the parents are telling you their child knows are actually those that they know. So, um, how do we know that it works? So we can test kids in the lab. We can't get everything, but we can test them. Um, we can be um, confident that um, if we have a child that um, we, we're not going to get all the words that a child knows and we're not going to get them to, do, to show us everything that they do know, but we can be reasonably confident that um, a child who um, talks a lot in the lab responds well to questions and will point out a lot of objects that they know is actually better at language than a child who um, does not do many of those things. So the differences between children in the lab, we think, reflect differences in their actual ability. And we find that the same children um, will speak well and respond well to testing in a lab situation or talk to you in a lab situation, and their parents will say that they know a lot of words. And the same, um, the, the same for the child who doesn't speak very much in a lab situation, doesn't appear to know much language, and their parent also reports that they don't know much language. So um, we, when we have a group of children and on one ability they're ordered in the same way from low to high, and on another ability, that, uh, on another test they're also ordered in the same way from low to high, we say that these two measures, um, these two numbers are correlating with each other. And so we find that language ability as we measure it in the lab, language ability as we measure it on our parent report instrument, we find that they correlate well with each other. So that's one of the ways in which we're confident that parents are reporting these things correctly. Children are more um, relaxed in the home. Um, they're more likely to give you a true reflection of their language ability if you record them or video them in the home. Um, and so we've also done this and we find that the um, children's language abilities as recorded in their natural situation in the home also correlates with um, the language ability as the parent reports it. Um, it's harder to control what the toys are or what the situation is in the home, which is a little bit of a drawback to that type of measure. Um, so if, for example, um, the parent uh, sits with a child and just looks at one book, then the child doesn't have as many things to talk about and you can't necessarily be sure that they're giving you um, all the language that they could. But you still find that um, the language that you record in the home correlates well um, in with um, the parents' report of how many words they know and how many gestures they can do. Um, 
as I've said, um, toddlers don't often cooperate. They often um, don't do something when you want them to do what you want them, something that you want them to do. But they could still know something without showing you that they know it. So one of the other ways that we know that um, parent report um, works and that it's a good measure of what children know is by looking at a measure where we don't ask the kids to do anything. We just get inside their minds. Um, and this is event-related potential. So that's... I've. I, so a much better picture today. I'm sorry that's a bit blurry, but um, this is a method using, I don't do this, so I'm, I'm just going to give you a quick guide to it. Um, but researchers who do this um, measure, um, it's a form of EEG, an electroencephalogram, and it measures the naturally occurring electrical currents within the toddler's brain. So, um, on the hairnet, or well, it's not a hairnet, on the swimming cap type thing that the toddler's wearing, um, you can't see it very well because it's quite blurry, um, but there are um, wires that are measuring the currents that are flowing between each pair of the electrodes. And when something happens in the toddler's brain, the, then a current will change or flow. So this is um, a set of graphs showing um, the solid lines are words that the parent said that the child understood. And the dotted lines are words that the parent said that the child didn't know. Now, one child might know dog and another child might know cow. So, for the children that know dog, the solid line reflects dog. For the children that know cow, the solid line reflects cow. So, it's not like the words that produce the solid line are always cow, dog and easy and common words and the words that reflect, that reflect the dotted line are albatross and aardvark. Um, for each child, it's the same set of words, but for each child they know some of them and they don't know others. So this doesn't ask the child to do anything, they don't have to look at anything, they don't have to point at anything, they don't have to say anything. All they have to do is sit there and tell us using um, their um, event related potentials which is these that whether they recognize the word or don't know the word um, so the children's responses the children's brain responses are different to the words that their parents say they know and the words that their <coughs> parents say they don't know um, so as i say it's not my specialty but um, you can see that one of the most common things um, that the one there that's got the notations on it um, is, you can't really see that terribly clearly, um, but down is positive and up is negative, and in general, um, they look for more negativity. In other words, it goes up more. There's, I don't know why they do it that way around. Like I say, not my specialty, <laughs> um, and that seems to be what's happening more in the words that are comprehended that the parent says the child comprehends. Okay, so our new UK project looking at the CDIs, um, what are we doing with this? Um, so obviously the um, instruments were originally developed in the US and you don't want to have US words in them, um, at, but this had already been done and seemed like a good idea and has been done quite a long time ago, so you don't say pacifier, you say dummy, you don't say diaper, you say nappy. Um, you don't say stroller these days, well you do, but these days you say anything from stroller, buggy, pram and pushchair. Um, Cheerios um, at least were not that common as a snack here, um, maybe kids are eating cornflakes. Is that enough? For example, Cheerios for at least 20 years have been the snack of choice for American parents. Every child from the age of about eight months or so will be ha having a tub of Cheerios very, very commonly. That's not what we do with cornflakes here. So. A child in the US is more likely to know that word, and it is one of the words that, that the kids have been asked about, whereas um, a child in the UK um, is not going to be as likely to know a word for cereal because they might have more of a variety of these. So that's just a really simple answer, but there are lots of complex cultural issues why just translating the words from even one form of English to another is not going to be enough. So what we need to do, we need to work out what words and what gestures children are likely to know. Gestures are really, really important for younger children. Gesture comes before spoken words. 
Um, and like I say, it's communicating in gestures like waving and nodding, but it's also um, gestures that um, mean something like pretending to brush your hair or pretending to brush your teeth. We need to work out how many words children actually know. We need to develop a set of norms. Um, and I'll show you a graph in a minute that shows you what norms mean. But if you're familiar with um, children's growth, then you'll know that children who grow averagely are said to be on the 50th centile. Children who are taller um, are said to be on a higher centile, so maybe 90th or 95th. And children who are shorter are said to be on a lower centile, maybe 5th, 10th or 25th. Um, and that's basically what we're doing, is we're working out for a given age um, and a certain number of words, is the child who knows that many words halfway up the, the group of kids? Are they near the top of the group of kids? Um, are they um, number 90 or 95 out of 100? Or are they at the bottom of the group of kids? Are they number 5 or 10 out of 100? So we need to know for a given age, what's the average number of words that kids know and where will another child fall? And we also want to work out what's the influence of children's social world? What's the um, influence that the world a child is growing up in, the world an infant is growing up in, has on their language development. So, some of the things we're looking at. Um, these are some of the things that we ask in our gesture questionnaire. Can your child pretend to read a book? <coughs> and you will note that book is not in a reading orientation. Does your child pretend to talk on the phone? Does your child pretend to sweep up? Um, and one of the other important things that we're looking at in the UK, we're, this is a UK-wide study, we're looking at dialect and variability. So um, we are particularly focusing and making sure that we get the right answers from parents on things like, um, do they use a dialect word? So we've got baby versus bairn versus win. Um, do they use a different word? They may have a dolly and they call it a baby. Um, do they use a baby word? So um, if they say gog or goggy instead of dog, we, we need to make sure that we've got the child's actual word and that the parents aren't saying, well, no, they don't say whatever that one was. They don't say baby, they say bear, and so I'm not putting that one down. And we need to reflect the dialect variability within the UK. Um, so... Um, there has been some data collected before looking at how many words children in the UK know at a given age. So here these lines are the um, mean, in other words, they're halfway up the number of words for a given age. Um, the dark figures are for the UK and the light figures are for the US. Um, so um, if you take a random child, let me just check my notes here which one I was going to show you. Um, a random child aged 18 months, so that's 1.6, um, and they can say five words, so that's between halfway between naught and five. Then this set of data for the UK shows that they're dead on the line. But if they were on the US line, then five words at 18 months would be considerably below the mean. Now, we don't know exactly why this is. One thing we do know is that the data from the UK, there's not enough of it, and it's all from one area of the UK, so it's not representative, and we don't know if this is true of the whole UK. But we don't know why the data from the UK looks so different from the data from the US. There are two possible reasons. One is that British parents are more conservative about how many words their children know. They may not be as willing to say yes to a question about does your child know this word as the US parents. The other possibility is that this group of parents in the UK were almost all about to come into the lab and have their child's language tested and they didn't want to be shown up. They didn't want to say yes my child can, can say the word dog only to get into the lab the next day and have their child say well I'm not saying that, why would I say that? Um, so those are two reasons why we don't know what, what the answer is. But one thing we do know is that if you use the much larger data set from the US and, work, and take a child's um, language and the number of words they know and try to work out um, whether they, where they are in the distribution, where are they at the 5th centile, the 50th, the 90th, 
you're going to be sending more kids to be assessed by the speech therapist because you're going to think that more kids have got poor language skills. So it's pretty important that we get this right because the data that we collect is going to be used to work out which kids need to go and be followed up or possibly have a speech and language assessment. So, I said we were also interested in the world that the child lives in and how this affects their, the language that they know. So, on the left, we've got um, the first 20 words that um, a group of American kids could say. And on the right, we've got a group of the first 20 words that a group of Italian kids could say. Um, and it's got a translation, thankfully, because I don't speak Italian. Um, you'll notice that quite a lot of them are the same, so mummy, daddy. Um, you'll also notice some things that are missing from the US side. No grandma, no grandpa. I can tell you that auntie and uncle are not far behind and they're not on the US list anywhere as near, near the top. Um, and you'll notice things that are missing from the Italian side. There aren't as many names of objects, so there's no... There's water and there's ball, but there's no book, no bird, no balloon. Um, I don't think there's bottle. Um, and there's also quite a lot of um, the animal sounds that I was talking about. There's animal sounds on both sides. Um, but there's also, um, so there's thank you in Italian and there isn't thank you in American. I quite like that one. Um, so, um, grandma and grandpa routines, yes. Yeah, routines such as um, peekaboo, bedtime, um, this one that says is no more, that's all gone, um, are more common in the um, Italian infants. Um, it's not really rocket science that if you see your grandma and grandpa more often, you're going to say their names earlier. But it may sound obvious, but what you've also got is you have got, and you have got them on both sides because you've got shoe and you've got ball and things, um, you've got a lot of names for objects and a lot of the theories about what, how children develop language have said for quite a long time that children start off by naming objects and in some cases have gone as far to say the reason they start off by naming objects is because they are hardwired to name objects and if anybody says that to me, especially the word hardwired, then um, I get very hot under the collar um, and this is the kind of data that says to me why that's not a very helpful thing to say. So one of the things that we're looking at is we're looking at um, who do the kids spend their time with in our sample um, and um, what, how does this relate to their first words, um, who do they have in their home um, and also things like um, what, um, who works and who's at, who, um, who doesn't work, so who's at, ho who's at home more with the child. So not just um, do they see their grandparents regularly, but how much of the time do they spend with their parents and so on. So all of this, this um, set of interesting questions add up to the UK CDI project. So at the moment we're looking at kids um, aged 8 to 18 months, um, or we're looking at younger babies who we will call back when they are eight months. And if you know anyone that's interested, that's our website. So that's not the only thing that we use parent report for. This isn't the only project. I've talked quite a lot about this. I'm going to talk a little bit now about some other ways and some other places in which we can use this type of instrument. One setting that um, we have used this successfully in, and you would be surprised as it's a questionnaire, but there's an easy way around this, is in settings where parents can't read. So um, two of the projects that I've been involved with have been looking at the link between health and development um, in Kenya and in Indonesia. Those are two of the um, toddlers in Kenya. Um, the Kenyan project looked at um, the influence of being exposed to HIV on children's <coughs> language um, and not surprisingly there was a huge um, influence but it would have been very difficult to test this directly in this age group um, so it, it's very easy to use these with parents that can't read because you just read it out to them and it does take quite a long time but um, often parents are quite happy to talk to you uh, rather than necessarily sit down and write a, an impersonal and boring questionnaire they're quite happy to talk to you about what their child can do um, so in these settings 
Toddlers are very uncooperative. In these settings, children are particularly shy. They don't go to preschool or nursery. They're not used to seeing unfamiliar adults and they're particularly not used to a formal situation where a strange adult asks them to do something. Kids that go to nursery um, or um, are more used to um, the kind of world where their abilities are assessed by the health visitor or the GP or whatever are more used to that. It's easier for kids in Western settings to... Um, perform for a strange adult. Um, so while we were validating the questionnaire um, in Kenya, in other words, while we were looking at whether the questions that we were asking the parents were correlated with the, the abilities of the child when we tested them, we got 20 kids and we gave them 20 objects each and we said what are these objects called and not a single one of them said anything at all, which was a bit disappointing as we knew they could talk. Um, so we thought of another way to test that. Um, we recorded their language, a slightly different group of kids, but we recorded their language while they were playing. Um, we found that um, the number of words they knew was correlated with, um, the number of words that they used while they were playing rather was correlated with the number of words their parents said they knew. The mistakes they made in grammar while they were talking, while they were playing, was correlated with the mistakes their parents said they knew. And in younger kids, um, they would at least point to objects, although out of the 20 kids, one wouldn't point to anything, it just sat there. Um, and they, um, when you say which one's the cup, which one's the ball, then that was related to what their parents said they understood and we could get them to do gestures like bye bye and brush your hair and brush your teeth um, and that was also related to their parents report of what they could do. Um, so in case you're interested these are the first 10 spoken words in Kiswahili. Um, so um, mummy daddy meh is what the goat says, um, yum yum what the cow says, um, and the sounds and names for cats, cows and goats. That's what they have in a small Kenyan coastal village. Um, so we can also test other things than language. We can test non-verbal abilities, non-language abilities. Um, so um, this is from a small scale study um, where we looked at quite young infants, so six to 24 months. And we asked the parents, first of all, things like, um, can your child do a puzzle? Um, can your child um, push a car along? Um, I can't remember all the questions, but we also got the parents to play a few games with the ch child. So not just what can your child do, but can you get your child to play a game? Parents are better at doing this because um, the child already knows the parent and isn't shy. Um, this technique was used as part of a huge study. It's not mine, I'm very envious of it. Um, of twins um, looking at the um, genetic and environmental influences on children's development. Their key focus is on why children in the same family are so different. Um, and they have masses of extremely interesting findings. It's been going on for years and years. They use a lot of parent report because they have, I wrote this down, but it's obviously not on this slide. Um, no, I haven't. Anyway, I think it's about 10,000? I can't remember the exact number, but anyway, it's in the thousands of twins. There's absolutely no way they could ever have tested all of those using research assistance. So they used a lot of parent report and they also got the parents to do a lot of testing. Here's some, oh, I've gone the wrong way. Um, here's some of the little tests that they got the parents to do. Um, again, they got them to tell, you, tell them things as well. Things like, does the child recognise themselves when they see themselves in the mirror? Um, not non-language things. So um, will they copy you making a train out of blocks? Will they copy you making a tower out of blocks? Um, we can also use parent report in screening and in assessment of developmental disorders. Um, so at ELVES, which is another very large scale study, early language in Victoria, that's Victoria in Australia, um, found, for example, using si very similar questionnaires that um, when they saw kids at, when they, or rather when they asked parents about kids at 12 months, the, ch the um, baby's use of gesture and toys predicted how good they were going to be at language at the age of two. Um, and interestingly, they were able to work out that toys and gesture use was better at working out who would have spoken language problems than either the characteristics of the family, which you might think would um, influence the children's language and also the spoken language at one and that's an interesting and helpful thing to know because you would think that you'd be looking at 
can they talk at one and the ones that have real problems are going to be the ones that we need to follow up at two and actually that wasn't the case um, so um, it's not just um, a useful way to assess the children but it's also a really useful thing to find out about how to predict language delay um, it's quite common in diagnosing a developmental disorder to ask the parent about how the child developed when they were younger. Um, so for example in diagnosing autism it's quite common to ask parents to recall when their child could do certain developmental milestones. So when could they walk? Um, when did they start saying one word? When did they start putting two words together like daddy sock? Um, and also have they ever had this pro problem, that problem? It's frequently used if you've got an older child, um, a caregiver or, an, or a parent, um, including up to teenagers and adults. Now, um, I had looked through studies that had used this type of questionnaire and I found that um, one um, meta-analysis, that's a type of study that compares a lot of studies, had multiple studies where the oldest of the adults that they were asking about was 47. So you're asking the parents about their 47 year old when they were three. Um, the average age, because this is different studies, the average age in one study was six and three quarters. They're, so they're asking a six, parent of a six and three quarter year old about when they were three. And then in, an, the old, in another study, the average age was 18 and a half. So again, asking the parents of an 18 and a half year old about when they were three. Um, I'm being boring about this, but I'll show you why. So the parents are being asked to recall their child's abilities and you would expect single words, phrases and walking to all come before the age of three. So they're asking them all about their child before they were three. Um, and the government decided to get in on the act um, and ask um, parents of children age one to seven about their first word. What, what was their first word? When did they say it? And did their child have a problem with speech? So the most common um, how did I get there? Hang on. Uh, sorry about that. Um, this one. <coughs> no. Okay. Um, the most common age for them to say the first word was nine months. Um, and the most common age at which they, the parents said that they could put two words together was 13 to 18 months. And 17% said that their child had a slight or significant difficulty in learning to speak. So let me refer you back to this. Um, from here, about half of children have words by 14 months, um, but have one word at 14 months. That's quite a bit bigger than nine months, which is what parents remembered. Um, I can tell you that about half of children put words together at about 21 or 22 months. Again, that's quite a bit older than the parents were remembering. But I can also tell you that about 5 to 7% is the correct figure for kids who've got speech um, delay or difficulty. I don't think we can necessarily rely on what the parents are remembering. Remember, they were being asked when their kids were between 1 and 7 about their kids' abilities when they were about 1. That's a much, much smaller age gap than in the parents of kids who had autism. So, oh, sorry. Um, we had a look at this. We had a group of parents where we had asked the parents at 18 months which of 100 words their child knew. We happened to still have their names and addresses when the, parent, when the kids were seven. We thought we'd go back and ask again. So we did. Um, we had exactly the same questionnaire. We said, when your child was 18 months, when you filled this questionnaire in before, which words could your child say? Which words could your child understand? There was absolutely no relationship whatsoever between the number of words that the parents said at seven, my kid knew this at 18 months, and the number of words that they actually knew at 18 months. Some of the parents said, but my child understood all these hundred words when they were 18 months. Nobody had said that at 18 months. Um, and all of the scores they remembered were higher than the scores that they actually got at the time. Hindsight has got rose-tinted spectacles. Um, so, what does this tell us about remembering your child's abilities? So, interestingly, the kids who had quite poor language at 18 months, their parents were more likely to write back. Um, we're not quite sure why that is, especially since they were saying their kids had better language. It's generally the opposite. We, we saw the kids at five years as, as well, 
Um, and they, at that point, we were asking them, what can your kid do now? And it was mainly the parents whose kids were doing okay that um, got back to us. So maybe if you were worried in the past, now you'll get back in touch. We weren't quite sure about that. But you're not likely to be accurate. That's the lesson from this. Now, we, do, we would love to know, particularly with autism, it seems quite promising that there may be some early signs of autism before a child is diagnosed. And there have been some interesting and successful studies looking at things like eye contact in first birthday videos. A lot of people do video these. And there, uh, there have been some interesting studies look, looking at that. And there have been some attempts at asking about the child's ability at the age of around one. For example, um, using prompts like, um, can you tell me about something that happened around the child's first birthday? Can you remember who you visited, where you went? At that time, when you were at the grandparents' house or whatever, could they walk? Could they say such and such? Could they stick their tongue out? But we don't actually know if these hints help parents. And it's something that's quite important to find out because if you have a child who has a developmental um, difficulty, then one of the criteria for diagnosis of some disorders is that this happened before a certain age. So you've got to go back and find out what the child could do before a certain age. Unless you've got records like health visitor records, you've got to ask the parents. So what have we learned? We've learned that we can trust parents. We can trust um, parents, including parents who can't read and write um, in developing countries. They're good at reporting what their children can do. We've also learned that they're good at testing their child. So those ones where I, that I showed you where you ask the parents to get the child to build a block tower or to hide something, those also correlate well with children's abilities um, if you test them in the lab on those similar kinds of testing. But it mainly works when you're asking them about current behaviours. Be very careful about past behaviours and be especially careful about the timing of past behaviours. So, some more of my reluctant participants. I can't have the, the, the food out of the cupboard, it's not fair. Apparently the milk was warm this time. That's the end. <laughs>